Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today is John Tabas, who is the founder, CEO, chairman of the board of Books. John, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, good to have you here. Uh, interested to learn about the story, and that's probably a great place to start. Tell us a little bit, little bit about yourself, your background, and how you came to uh, start Books. Sure thing. Yeah, so uh, I... Uh... I'm an interesting sort of journey professionally. You know, I, I, I came out of undergrad thinking I was going to go into investment banking. Uh, at Notre Dame, I was in this program that sort of produced some best in bankers and was really deep down that path and got exposed to the world of consulting almost at the last minute and ended up actually taking a job at a banking company. And uh, right. worked, worked at Bain for a bit and, and sort of got the strategy bug, really like the sort of storytelling, the research part of what, what strategy consulting was. And uh, as the next step, I got my MBA at UCLA and then worked at the Walt Disney Company as, as a corporate strategist for about seven years. Okay. And it was great. It was a great job. Um, a job that a lot of people would, would love to have. Cool products, great people, yeah. good pay, you know, mm -hmm. free, free, since to the park, all the good, <laughs> fun things that come working at, at Disney, right? Um, but, uh, but what was missing was this, I had this sort of hankering and this constant need to build something. And I, I never really thought of it as a career. I thought of it as like a side hustle, like a, a hobby. And so, you know, I would pull teams together, we'd work on things and we'd try to launch it. It didn't quite work. And I did that with, with you know, a blog. It got, we got like a quarter million visitors a month at one point and did it with a nonprofit. And I was always sort of just tinkering. And, uh, and eventually a friend of mine, Andy Dunn, who founded Bonobos, started Bonobos. And I watched sure. his sort of whole trajectory with, uh, with that company and was like, huh. And that sounds, that's actually pretty cool. Why don't, why don't I maybe just do that? But I wasn't as brave as he was. I wasn't willing to like jump off the cliff without any parachute. So instead I took a yeah. job at another venture back company as Shoe Dazzle, which was Kim Kardashian's subscription shoe service. Okay. And, uh, with about two days in, I was like, oh, I'm going to start one of these for sure. It was, this, <laughs> it was, it was so, it was so exactly the right fit, right? The, the pace that we knew, the big decisions that we made, the changes and responsibility that could be gained very quickly was very intoxicating and really fun after working at a great, but much slower moving, you know, 200,000 person employer, like the Walt Disney company. And, uh, and so I was now in the sort of the, the arena, but I didn't know what I wanted to build. And my co-founder, Juan Pablo Montufo Arroyo, whose great, 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 great grandfather led the revolution to make Ecuador an independent country, um, okay. went back to Ecuador and was running a flower farm and we started talking about it and he was like, Hey, the farmers in this equation at the beginning of the value chain, they have almost no power. And therefore, the, even though they're the producer of the product, they really, uh, they're really not treated really super well in this industry. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's, that's interesting. And, and we dug into why and three the layers of supply chain. And then I went and around the same time we're having this conversation, just went to order flowers for my mom. And I went to all the sort of typical players you would go to and had the same experience and Adam said 1999. Uh, they tried to sell me a million things. Uh, I ended up paying 85 bucks for the same thing that was advertised in 1999. And what showed up was not what I ordered and it didn't last very long. And as soon as I went through that experience and knowing sort of all the supply chain issues from my co-founder, I called him and said, there's gotta be a better way. We, we have to build something here that, that will fix these problems. And yeah. and that was like March of 2012, we we started working on the big company. Wow. So I, I want to go back to something you said there because I thought it was pretty interesting. When you started at Shoe Dazzle, you said you were just a couple months into it and you were like, this is the kind of business I need to start. And it was itself a subscription business, right? So what were some of the aspects of it that you were like, this is a good business to jump into or type of business? Yeah, so at that time, I, I genuinely wasn't, wasn't making that evaluation based on the business model or, or anything like that. It was more of the culture and Okay. The, the, the sort of what the, the, the startup life versus a subscription business. But when we started talking about flowers, you know, we felt like it was a natural place to have a subscription, right? And um, one flowers are largely, especially online flowers are given as a gift, right? And so why not give a gift that is delivers every month or every other month or every week right, versus just once, right? And mm -hmm. by definition, the product perishes. It does not last. And so it's a natural, uh, you know, area for replenishment. Yep. The, the, the challenge to that thesis is that very few people send flowers 12 times a year it, right. to, to all the people in their lives, let alone to one person. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really liked it because it also um, sort of hid our supply chain weakness, which was we were shipping products from Ecuador, Colombia, Chile, Peru, 
directly to the user in the US, the recipient in the US, that's a long journey. Mm-hmm. And not a lot of people when they're ordering for one off want to wait that long. But if it's on a subscription, that, that time doesn't matter. If it's you know, show up on the 15th and we ship it on the 10th, you don't really care versus if you ship it on the 11th or the, or the 8th, it, it doesn't matter to you. And so we had these yeah. 10 rules um, and that's what got us started down the path. Uh, and then over time, we learned what worked and didn't work. And it was really a journey of sort of ups and downs and trying to figure out that product for flowers. Okay. So was, was Book's model then from the beginning all about subscription or was it, hey, we're going to offer one-time purchase of flowers and with a subscription option? Yeah, we, we always had both. We felt like the barrier to get people to subscribe and this proved out true in the numbers was too high on sort of the first transaction. Like, okay. are you good at this? Are they good quality? Are they going to last? Is one I order going to show up? Because there's a lot of distrust in the space, right? Yes. Because of the way the sort of incumbents and in the, the industry have worked for a very long time, reliability and dependency and dependability is not really what uh, the industry stands for. And mm-hmm. so we, we felt like we had to build trust with folks through one-off purchases first. Uh, and, and we got we got a decent subscriber base relatively early on, but it kind of never really topped 10, 15% of revenue um, because of this, this barrier of, hey, how often do I really need to send flowers? Do I, and so what most people did in those days was they just decided it's going to be a really great gift. I'm going to give this as a really great gift to my mom for Mother's Day instead of just flowers on one day. She's going to get flowers all year round. Mm-hmm. And that was a great use case, but it was a fairly limited number of folks who were going to spend $500 a year on sending a gift to someone. They were really kind to people who really love their moms or their, their spouses or whatever it might be, but it wasn't a, a, a huge tam. Gotcha. Okay. So what does that look like from 2012 to now? How, how has that evolved? Is that still kind of the case? You see a lot of people coming in, making these one-time purchases and maybe moving over to subscription. Or have you gotten enough of a name in the market where this is a quality recurring subscription and people are going straight there? Yeah, so we went through a couple different iterations along the way. So when we actually first launched, we had three different types of subscriptions, which was an interesting experiment. And, and we were saying, you can buy once or try one of these three. The first one, which at the time we called regular blooms, was just your typical subscription. Every month, every other month, whatever cadence you wanted, you would get flowers. And that was sort of the, the nice deal. Uh, we had a second subscription, which was uh, I thought really, really genius, but never really took off, was this idea of, hey, you can subscribe to a specific date. I'm going to sign up for my mom's birthday every year. So that mm-hmm. way you're never forgetting, you're never last minute, mm-hmm. and the flowers are just going to go on the date. Yep. You see, you're nodding. You like yeah. this idea. Yeah, I'm loving this everyone, idea. <laughs> everyone loved this idea whenever I'd talk about it, but no one would sign up for it. And the reason why really? is... It's a, it's a really easy thing to explain to you in person or to have a conversation. I mean, I would talk yeah. at events and I'd describe this product and every guy in the room would be like, oh, I'm signing up. <laughs> I would get down 20 sign up, <laughs> right? For sure. um, but in a digital environment where you're trying to explain how it works just with clicks and, and text, it was a lot harder. I can break right into it was almost zero. And so over time, we ended up sunsetting that product on its own. You know, I, I still have dreams of it coming back, but it was really a, a low conversion rate product. And then the third one, which, which was also kind of unique and different, what we call Just Because, which is you can subscribe to randomly send flowers across the year to whomever it is that you want to surprise with flowers. And so instead of you having to be the one who randomly decided to bring flowers home from work, flowers are going to show up on a Tuesday next week, and then again hmm. in three weeks, and then again six months later. And it was literally a random algorithm that would just pump out flowers so that you could be the best husband, boyfriend, or, you know, girlfriend, whatever it is, and just surprising folks. With flowers, similar to the second product, it never really took off. Okay. Um, and so we we did a lot of work because just like your reaction, we're like, people believe in this. They want this product. We know it. And they do. Uh, but, you know, some things sell well online and some things don't, right? We, have, we still have stores for a reason. I think it's a great candidate for like at a <laughs> farmer's market, getting people to sign up, but tough to be yeah. online. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, our subscription business was always strong, but never really the business. And in 2017 or 2018, we did a whole bunch of work to try to understand, you know, what, what really makes this work for the customers. Because the product was really compelling. You get 40% off of our regular retail pricing. Uh, you get free delivery, also great. And, and we felt like that's a really compelling reason to use this thing, but we still have the numbers. So we spent some time with our customers. We dug into sort of the use cases, how people use it, how they didn't use it. And we came around back with sort of one main sort of big issue, which is that free committing to an ongoing sort of forever until you cancel it 
40, 60, $80 a month just felt like too big of a commitment for a lot of people. It was yeah. just too much. And yep. so we did, we did two things differently. The first was we, we started doing sort of smaller bundles, like order th- by three. And that, okay. that gave a little bit of a, hey, I can try this without fully buying. Try before you mm-hmm. buy. It. And that, that sort of like greased the wheel a little bit. It wasn't the answer, but it, it helped us get this mindset of like, okay, if they don't feel like they're fully committing to like a year, even though they never were, it was always cancelable any money. Uh, that helps. And so then it led to our current product, which if you, you know, check out books.com, which is B-O-U-Q-S.com, and you go to the subscription product, it is inherently completely flexible. So you can change the day it delivers. You can change where it delivers. So if you have a subscription that's monthly, you can send it 12 different recipients or just one. Uh, so for, if you have a mom's birthday this month and sister's birthday the next month, and then Christmas coming after that, you can use it in different ways. And so that okay. flexibility was really a big piece of it. And then you can pause it. You can skip a month. You can have it default to your own home if you want. So you can just have the sort of non-gifting months, just beautify your own home. Mm-hmm. Flexibility was the key to making it work. And no joke, we launched that in January of 2019 and our subscriber base grew sixfold in six months. Wow. I mean, wow, that's amazing. Through you the roof. Uh, because people now it's saw it as one of the lowest price flower, delivered flowers in the market. Our flowers out the door um, at the lowest end of the range is in the mid, mid to upper forties. No one touches that price delivered online. Not the big guys, not the small guys. You're getting a dozen roses for 40 some dollars delivered flat. That's including Valentine's day. That's including mother's day. No one touches it. So the value is there that it is sort of 40, 50% off is still there, but now I can use it the way I want to use it. Right. Yeah. And I might yeah. be a guy who's dating yeah. lots of different women and I want to impress them all. Well, I could use this description. I might be married for 20 years and want to impress one lady. I can send them all to her or everything in between. And that yeah. is really what that, that subscription base really grow. So I think that is absolutely fascinating and worth kind of diving into because I've had so many conversations around what constitutes a subscription. You know, it's everything from like just basic replenishment of certain goods on a fixed date every month. Or yeah, I mean, so many of us are used to streaming right now where we're paying that same amount every month. Um, but there's all of these hybrid models p- popping up where it's maybe a smaller fixed fee with some usage-based component to it, or it's all usage-based sometimes in the case of SaaS. Um, but what you're talking about here, when you saw such high growth, when you introduce all of that flexibility in your subscription, kind of sounds like something a- even a little bit different from that because it is ongoing engagement for sure. You have this ongoing relationship, a card on file for payment and all of that kind of thing. But it really... It, it takes a completely different form when you're talking about, I can skip a month altogether. I can change the date. I can send it over here. I can do a lot of different things. So it is a recurring transaction with the customer, but how and when that happens is entirely put in the hands of the consumer. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And in a lot of businesses, that would probably kill their metrics. Yeah, right? it, 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 would. it would be a terrible yeah. decision. And it's probably why it took us six and a half, seven years to figure it out. It's not mm-hmm. sort of a standard way to think about it. But at the end of the day, right, any product needs to meet the customer needs. And in our customers, flowers every month or every week for a long period of time without flexibility around it was not what they wanted. It was not what they needed. Um, and it just took us some time and some sort of insight to, to figure that out. And so, you know, the definition of subscription that you mentioned is morphing and changing. I think the way it used to be was, hey, every month you pay money and you get a thing. Because that's what cable yep. was, right? That, yep. That's where it all started is cable bundles. Yep. Yeah. And Magazines, yeah. those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. And now mm-hmm. much, or your gym membership, whatever it might be, mm-hmm. you're paying money, you're yep. using a thing. Um, but now it's much more about, hey, how do I build a persistent relationship with the customer? Right. It's it, and it, outside of, you know, sending emails and sort of retargeting and all those types of things you do from a marketing perspective. How mm-hmm. do I keep them from going to somewhere else? Google is a powerful tool. You can go online any day of the week and search for our competitors and say, hey, I want to look for a better deal or I want to look for different flowers or it might be. Um, but yeah. once we get you into this, what we see is it's incredibly sticky and churn is incredibly low because no one else can do the price value that we can do because we ship it directly from the farm. And yeah. so once you get people on, we kind of have them. So it was really about opening the top of the funnel. It wasn't about fixing the bottom. The bottom. It's not a leaky bucket. The bucket was nice and strong. It was really about what needs do they have how do we address them? And so we decided to fundamentally change the product. And look, the, the subscribers of the ad later, way more of them, they do not send as often as the much smaller group that we used to have. 
but they mm-hmm. send less frequently because of the flexibility. But mm-hmm. they stay with us and over their lifetime, which now lasts much longer, they still yes. send more. But you know, in yeah. a given year, they're going to be less engaged in the platform. They're going to send fewer flowers by definition. Because before they had to send 12. Now yep. they've done three or six or, t- or 12 or 14, whatever they want to do. And so it really is about sort of giving the power to the customer to decide, hey, I want to use this product this way. How do you engage with the, the customer and, and deliver to them that flexibility? Is it all through a mobile app? Do you, do you guys do a lot of push notifications? Like how, how can the customer tell you, oh, send this one here or wait, uh, send that one next week, not this week? Like how, how do you manage that with each customer? Yeah, we, we, we actually tried a, a, a native and, a, and then a, a nap and a wrapper for a while. And, and okay. you know, s- certain percentage of folks would use it. But in commerce, it's hard to find great examples of folks where the app is the primary mode of, of communication. It's pretty rare, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we have it, had it. It's, it's not really the primary modality. Um, the, the website itself, you know, inside of your sort of managed my subscriptions is where most people will end up. And I would say it's probably... I'm going to guess here, 80% email and 20% text message in terms of how they're interacting with that on a monthly basis. And, you know, the 20% probably signed up more recently and the 80% probably signed up in the past, right? Because mm-hmm. everyone's come level with text message as a communication with, with companies has really exploded in the last two, three years. And so yes. most of the subscribers were, were acquired before that. But, um, you know, but it is important that folks know when it's coming, where it's going and what the flowers are, because... If you're going to change it from one address to another, you know, you're sending this one to your wife and those are like romantic red roses. Now this one's going to a business colleague. You don't want the same flowers on the same <laughs> note going to those two recipients. Awkward. Right? <laughs> so it's super important that it's really clear how to get there and when you can do it. And, and the good thing is, is that most people sign up for a date each month, the first or the 15th or the end of the month so that they know, hey, this is when it's going to come. They kind of are trained. And then we send our reminders, you know, a week and then six and then five days before, depending on, on sort of the ship date. Uh, so they make sure that folks know that they have that opportunity to change it. But it's, yeah. you know, it's the website and it's, it's email and text, you know, sort of basic stuff. Yeah. It strikes me as one of the reasons this probably works so well is there's a direct correlation between for, for a consumer or a subscriber into what they're paying you versus what they're getting out of it, right? If they need to skip a month, they didn't pay anything. If I have a gym membership and I'm paying every, every month and I'm not going, I'm starting to get frustrated with kind of myself, you know, for not extracting the value out of it. And I'm constantly playing this mental game of making sure I'm getting at least that much value out of it every month. But okay. you, through all of this flexibility have kind of equated the two together without going to a purely transactional model, which is just them calling you or going to the website when and if they want flowers. It is still this ongoing kind of transactional relationship or prearranged relationship. So it kind of, you know, seems to bridge those two ga- uh, two areas pretty well. So where do you think this can work and where do you think it, don't go down this road, this won't work for this type of business or problem. Yeah, and, some, and one thing I know too, is the gym, which is really a key part of it is if you forget to go to the gym, it's a negative experience, right? I spent the money and I didn't get anything. If you forget to skip a boot and it shows up at your house, you're happy. Right. So when the flowers yep. show up, there's still some value there. On, yep. the, on, the, on your center table, you go, I was going to skip this month, but man, these are beautiful. And you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the place is, is brighter and it smells better. And you're kind of like, oh, I don't mind that I, that I forgot mm-hmm. skipping this month. So it's a little bit of a reverse it's psychology important. and sort of the, the risk reward um, behavior. But you know, I, I, I think the consumer goods, especially, right? Lots of companies have gotten big around subscriptions around, around goods. But certain things you get to enough of, and then ultimately people just cancel, right? Mm-hmm. You, I, I don't want to name any particular names, but if you have a subscription to Widget X and you get a new one every month, at some point you're going to go, man, I got 23 Widget Xs. Mm-hmm. I don't need another Widget X mm-hmm. and you're going to cancel. Whereas, you know, if you give them the flexibility around how often do you want it, when do you need it, uh, I'm going to pause this thing for three months, they might pause instead of cancel and then you get them back on when hey these widgets are no longer as interesting i've consumed all of them they're they're running they're getting a little old or whatever it might be yep. and so i think that you know on anything that's being shipped to the home on a subscription basis this could be really be interesting you know i've not seen it deployed in in, in digital content but you know and, and i i have not the knowledge here i worked at disney back in 2012 the last time before streaming at disney was even close to a thing but I have to imagine that there is some fatigue around the number of signups and the number of streaming services that people have in their home right now. And not all are yep. equally used. 
And right mm-hmm. now it's an all or nothing game. If you decide that service X, you're not using it enough, you can't pull it, right? Why not have a pause button? Why not pause that thing for three months? Or why not have a usage-based rate program? Hey, you watched a ton of our service this month. Yeah. You're paying the full amount. You've mm-hmm. only watched a little bit. You're going to pay a third of the amount. And so you're much less likely to churn. Like these things should and could be applied to almost any subscription space as long as you start thinking about the difference between long-term lifetime value and short-term lifetime value. Yeah. If you're just yeah. optimizing for right now today's metrics and today's users, you're going to keep it completely inflexible and just charge yep. them as many times as you can until they cancel. Yeah. Um, but then you're playing this game of having to constantly replenish the pod. Whereas if you go much more flexible, you're going to lower that lifetime value this year, but you're probably going to extend it dramatically over the long run. It, I think it depends on sort of your culture and what kind of business you're building and the pressures you have financially on which type of yeah. metrics you have to deliver uh, yeah. on sort of how you make that decision. But I kind of can't think of a place where enabling the customer to, to drive their own journey wouldn't help with the long-term outcome of the product. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think some of this is just leftover legacy views of how subscriptions work or subscription businesses, I should say, with the whole set it and forget it mentality, right? Like they're going to sign up, extract as much money as you can out of this customer because they're eventually going to cancel, right? So, you know, in, in in certain businesses, less usage equals less cost and, and more profit. Um, but that comes at the expense of a long-term relationship with the customer for sure. Um, but it sounds like a lot of the conversations I've had in this podcast and what you're kind of illustrating right now is that that can be turned on its head. Right, that long-term value of I, I might have less than I would have had, but these guys have higher LTVs, and especially at a time when customer acquisition costs are so high, it's better to keep them around in the longer term, even if there might be a month where they skip or spend less or or maybe even go away for a while. But you've established that positive relationship, and that LTV goes up, and it sounds like that's well, what you're seeing. And that trust then breeds word of mouth, which then gets you customers for free instead of having to pay for it. And sort of the, the you know, the flywheel kicks in. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm, we have some subscribers who have been with us for a decade. They're literally getting flowers every month for a decade. And that was their behavior before we gave the option to, to, to be more flexible. And it's their behavior afterwards. So it doesn't mean that everyone is going to take advantage of that or work the system. Are there a percentage of people that do? Absolutely. Right. But sort of the, the question is, is your sort of sort of lowest quality bottom five to 10% of customers worth defending against at the expense of the other 90% of customers who aren't going to sort of uh, yeah. work the system or look for the way out or look for the right. sort of fine print. And I think, especially in a category like flowers, which is about love and beauty and, and trust and, and celebrating life's most important moments, you kind of have to believe in people. Right. And, and we took a big leap in, in 2019 when we, when we made those changes and the customer behavior completely rewarded it. And I think, you know, at the time we talked about it, we said, look, these are people who are looking to celebrate their loved ones. Uh, we can't take a pessimistic view of how they're going to behave. We just can't. Yeah. And, and luckily we were right. If we were wrong, we would have shut that thing down and figure something else out. But, you know, the metrics have really proven that uh, what we felt about our customers is, is, is really how they behave beyond the numbers. Yeah. Well, well, let's, let's dive a little bit into customer acquisition. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we hear the recurring theme of it's expensive as all get out these days. And it seems like every channel, even the ones that used to be cost effective are, are keep going up. What have you guys seen? What's been the evolution for you? How were, how were you, uh, acquiring new customers in the early days and what does that look like today? Yeah, you know, I mean, for us, it's it's not all that exciting of a story. It, you know, in the first two, three years, it was so much organic growth, right? We were new, the model was new, the brand was new. We were sort of the first ones to come along. And now there's you know, a number of other brands that have, have done similar things, but sort of come along and say, hey, this thing can be different. So Shark Tank and Google SEO, like it was all up and to the right. And so crying customers in the early years was sort of almost like, riding the wave of positive sort of awareness, strength, and, and sentiment. Um, that call it like, that's it year one to three or one to four or something like that. Um, over time, right, as any company matures and you're now growing on a larger base, the amount you have to spend changes, the tax have to change, but the sort of the core of what we've done since the beginning hasn't changed much. You know, we, we, we take really beautiful photography. Um, we, we put really in, in inducing the pricing, and especially for these subscribers, you know, 40, 50% off again, mm-hmm. which gets us to a price point that I don't see replicated in the industry. And so 
the price point plus the, the imagery shows people like, hey, I can get something that looks like that. And it's going to be that because we control the whole supply chain. Uh, mm -hmm. For a price point that feels like it should be, it should not be possible, right? It feels like it should be double, triple what, what I'm paying. And so, you know, the imagery plus the pricing has really always been the core of, of what we do. In the early days, a lot of our messaging was more around the, uh, the sustainability, the direct from the farm relationship, or the yep. freshness. Mm -hmm. uh, what we learned over time was like, those things mattered, but those were, it's sort of more retention tools. They weren't the reason why people bought the first time. Okay. The reason they bought the first time was they saw a beautiful picture and thought, huh, my girlfriend would love that thing. You know, my mom would love that thing. And so it was really almost like a fashion sort of approach to messaging and, and, and those types of things, discounting beautiful photos, getting in front of things. From a channel perspective, you know, it's a very intent driven industry. So, you know, search is, is, is where things have lived for a really long time. We certainly sure. do our fair share of sort of the bigger tent pole kind of things to get awareness out there. Uh, Cause you know, in an $18 billion industry, we're still relatively small. But we, we reserve days more for like a Valentine's Day or a Mother's Day when just a lot more of sort of the the head yeah. the headspace of the consumer is really around this product. Mm -hmm. um, but we've certainly seen exactly what we were describing, right? Caps have gone up you know, each year for the last few years, um, sort of starting with the pandemic and, and sort of the shift in the way that Apple and, and, and therefore others have, have dealt with privacy and, and targetability, et cetera. And so, you know, we don't, we no longer sort of think of it as one big channel that we have to win in. It's stacking a whole bunch of smaller channels and, and, and incrementally winning in those channels. Um, and so that's, that's really the way that we've built the, the marketing stack today. Um, and you mentioned earlier that I'm founder, CEO, and chairman board. I'm actually no longer CEO. Um, our CEO used to be my chief revenue officer. She's now the CEO. Okay. It's some teams come from a marketing background. Uh, she took over uh, last summer um, as, as I moved over to a, a full-time chairman role. And, um, and, and really, we spent a lot of our time thinking about this challenge and how do you bring you know, customers in. We launched stores uh, about a year and a half ago specifically for this, for this issue as well. When you look at sort of the long-term trend of digital CACs, like 2012 to 15 was the anomaly. 2012 to 20 was probably the anomaly in terms of how cheap it was to acquire customers versus the way it's going to be long-term. Sure. And then mm -hmm. you look at traditional retail and you have a profitable retail store where you acquire a customer and make money in so doing. Um, it's a pretty nice shift in, in the economics. And so we now have uh, three stores live uh, with the plan to get to eight by the end of the year. So we're, uh, we're okay. really leading the, to physical retail. Yeah. Real, real quick, what was attractive about getting into to the physical retail side of things? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this, this idea of spending an additional marginal dollar on, you know, uh, digital acquisition, it has been, you know, sort of tested and, and learned by a bunch of others. Some have done third-party retail where they've taken their product and they put it on the shelf. Uh, Harry's famously did this with Target. Right, really yeah. big shift in, in what it looked like inside of, of their stores and, and for that brand. Uh, others opened their own stores. You know, Bonobos did their guide shops. Olberts does their own standalone uh, stores, et cetera, et cetera. You know, when we looked at it, we saw you know two big opportunities. One was that you know profitable customer acquisition. If you get four well profitable and someone walks in and you learns about your brand and thinks of a coupon code for online delivery, great, we just acquired a customer. That's great. But also it opened up a whole swath of the uh, space that we didn't really play in, which was weddings, events, and corporate buyers, you know, okay. $1,000, $10,000 average checks, depending on the size of the event, which, you know, very few people in the world are going to trust an online delivery delivery service to make sure their flowers <laughs> are their wedding day. We, we do it. Uh, it's a relatively small business, um, but, you know, the stores can do that in a way that, that we never really could online. So it was, it was sort of a one plus one equals three, you know, calculation. And so we started small. We have a tiny little 400 square foot store here in Beverly Hills, just south of the ID in partnership with uh, Alfred's Coffee. Uh, Josh, who's the founder of Alfred's, is a buddy of mine from business school. I was like, hey, flowers, <laughs> coffee, that'd be fun. And he's like, well, I got this safe. And so we tried it out and, you know, customers really love it. We've got like an 18 foot tall tree with flowers falling from the ceiling. It's a beautiful place to sip your coffee and it smells wonderful for his customers. And yeah. then customers walk into their coffee and they say, hey, I'll take a bouquet on that. Great. Uh -huh. So it's really been a, a great experience. Uh, the the Manette promoter scores are through the roof. The uh, loyalty of the business is through the roof. But, you know, now it's about how do you get more than three? Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's turn to the to the technology operation side of the house for, for a minute. You know, one of the things that struck me real quick when you were talking about all of the flexibility that you guys introduced into your subscriptions is complexity. Right. Being able to do that, deliver on these, you know, adjustments that customers can make can create chaos and fulfillment 
technology, operations, customer service, everything. So when you were in particular, you know, implementing those changes, I guess it must've been in 2018 into 2019. How did you guys approach that? I mean, those were big changes. I, I assume it affected the entire organization, but how did you go about that? Yeah, you know, we, it was one of the hard things about making the decision was we spent a lot of time looking at every solution at the market, every player for off the shelf subscription software, and no one could do what we needed it to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it became really a build versus buy sort of decision. And yep. it was very expensive to start over from scratch with a brand new build. Um, yep. The cost of engineering only goes up every year. Um, and so it was a fundamental bet. So, you know, we launched it in 2019, but we started working on it in, in, in mid to late 2017. Um, and we decided to build it ourselves because starting okay. with any other outside service um, was going to take at least as long to get them to change everything about the way their product worked. And then we'd be beholden to them. So, you know, we actually hired an entire engineering team, product team, and, and built the whole thing from scratch. Um, and, you know, those are the two systems that really separate us, I think, from the pack in our space and really from a lot of startups is we built our entire supply chain sort of uh, optimization engine ourselves. It manages all international shipping, delivery, everything itself. Uh, we can ship hundreds of thousands of packages in a day with a team of four managing it because of that software. And then the other piece, and, and again, millions of dollars of development of that with this subscription platform. And so uh, we, we went off and we spent about a year, year and a half building it from scratch. Um, all with sort of this idea of building this flexible capability model. Um, and it's worked really well. You know, the, there, there are pieces to it that aren't perfect and we, we continue to have to, to uh, improve it. But again, the nice thing about this is it's sort of a long lead product. You get a delivery day, you got a month on average. Some people are two weeks, but most are a month to make your decision about when, you know, your next one arrives and where it's going to go. So you've got a lot of time. So communication, lead time, sort of, uh, experience for the customer is, is pretty easy to manage. Um, and so it's really all in the workflows and sort of the management of, of, of the, uh, of the orders. The, the magic of the two is really what makes it all pretty seamless is that the subscription engine is really about generating orders. This customer wants to go to this address on this date with these flowers, right? Yep. Um, and then that kicks over to the other system, uh, which we call the BFD. It's the, uh, boot flower delivery system. And, uh, <laughs> that, that looks at the entire network, you know, we've got. I don't know, two, two to three billion stems of production in our network at this point and looked at all the different nodes of where it could come from, quality, freshness, delivery times, and everything. It says, oh, this one order needs to go to this farm on this day. Um, and that matching is way more difficult than you'd think because some days are not ship days. Some days are not customs days. Some days yeah. are holidays. But it yeah. has to show up on the right date. The date is mommy's birthday. Right? Mm -hmm. not like. If you're, you know, no, no offense to Harry's razors, but if your razors show up on Monday or Wednesday, the customer doesn't really mind, right? They're, they're, when they arrive, they arrive. That's most products. Yep. But in flowers, the date is the date. Early is not good. Late is not good. So <laughs> the reliability of that technology and the scalability of it was really a, a, a worthwhile investment for us to, for the long run to make sure our customers are happy. Yeah, you hit on it right there. That, that, those logistics are almost the product itself. Pulling it at the right Correct. time, shipping it at the right time, and arriving at the right time. All of those are part of what I'm paying for. To your point with a razor, I just need the razor. I don't really care so much about the day. But that that's that's so core to your product that it made sense for you guys to build and that something is, like And that was, a, that was tens of millions of dollars of investment. And this is why there's no other sizable subscription floral business. Uh, because no one else knows how to buy it to build it. And or they're unwilling or unable to spend the money on it. Um, and, and we took a long-term view of saying we raised $24 million with our Series C back in the day. And we said, this is the place where we need to put it is into the capability to make sure subscribers are really happy. Um, and so you'll see other flower subscription businesses out there. There's single digit million businesses simply because they can't create this sort of matching in real time at scale. It's just really hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like it. But, but that was also enabled by the fact that you were going all the way down to the growers, right? So you, I mean, you were working with the farmers, so they knew that order. I, I imagine a lot of your competitors are, are buying from distributors or probably from all over the place. A hundred percent. Yeah. They're either going to a local florist that where they don't actually know what the inventory is, or they're shipping it to a middleman that has a warehouse, which has, you know, a certain amount of product. Yeah. We really feel like the key is, is the quality in the space is knowing exactly where it's coming from who shipped it and when, because then you can just follow the metrics. If you see a certain skew from a certain node is not working out, 
you shut that down and the system does it automatically. We just don't route orders there until we yes. get reliable metrics back from the testing okay. side and then we turn it back on again. And we're doing this network wide with again, like $3 billion uh, stems of production across the network. And so that's not a person that has to do that. The system just knows, hey, here's our threshold. This, this skew is breaking the threshold. Shut that skew down and shut it down. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm, I mean, you just explained it so simply, but I, I know what goes into those decisions and all the business rules and testing and everything. Oh, yeah. It was probably a tremendous amount of work. I remember talking to our technology team at the time, which we then tripled to, to build this stuff. And I described what I needed to do. And they all looked at me like, are you sure? Like, are you sure? sure? This is the big cliff you're jumping off. And I was like, <laughs> absolutely. This is the way this business works. Without it, it doesn't work. Um, yeah. and, and luckily we were right. Because if you we were wrong, it would have been a really bad choice. <laughs> Yeah, sizable gamble, but clearly one that paid off. Um, you, you know, you, you made that that much of an investment. What what data did you rely on to think that those these were the right decisions? Not not just to, you know, offer that to the customer this amount of flexibility, but to in, invest in it yourselves. Like, was how much of it was intuition? How much of it was data? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. You know, the the, the data was strong on the subscription business that we had and the customer response to our dropship, you know, one-off order of business was strong. I mean, customers just loved the business from the beginning. But what I kept seeing over and over was feedback from customers saying, you know, I'm canceling this thing because insert reason. And so it was mostly customer feedback saying, this system just doesn't work for me, right? Mm -hmm. Waited, the, the, the underlying uh, architecture that we had built didn't allow us to enable the customer experience that we needed. And we kept okay. hearing it back, both email based, Twitter, um, you know, in customer surveys, that promoter scores. It wasn't that they, the, the results were bad. And this is one of those things really hard as anybody leading any business is that when things like look good, right? An average is an average, whether it's your CAC or your LTV or whatever, half your customers are worse than whatever the number says. So if you yeah. have like, you know, a, a really nice net promoter score and the average is 73, half the people are below that and a good chunk are way below that. And that's sort of mm -hmm. looking at the full histogram was really important. And, and I kept looking at that like bottom 10% of dissatisfied customers. And the, the same thing kept coming up over and over again. I would have subscribed if I had to cancel because, right? And it was a, it was a big recurring theme. And, and then you have to start sort of projecting that from just those ones you hear from like, well, how many people never bought in the first place because of that? And so that's where the intuition part sort of comes in is there's, there's a nugget of insight from the data and then you start saying like, well, if I have the same concerns as this person and I get to this point in the funnel or whatever your sign up flow looks like, how many of those people are just bailing at that moment? And you can look at your yeah. conversion rate and say, hey, look, most people aren't converting, right? And even if it's a good conversion rate, how much more is going to sit on the table? And that really was, was what we saw as the opportunity. So there's a little bit of 50-50 like of following the tendrils, the breadcrumb down, the sort of data path, but then really taking a leap and saying, you know, hey, we believe that ultimately the customers are right and that what they're telling us is, is going to be the right product. And it also felt like the right product experience. It felt like it was going to be the thing that really unlocked the business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cl clearly it paid off. And now you've got plenty of data to prove that that gamble was correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so what, what, what's next for you guys? I, I mean, obviously you've built out the technology, you have a proven business, you guys have been scaling. Um, are you looking to get into offering other products to existing customers, maybe going to new markets? What does the next couple of years look like? Yeah. So retail expansion will be a big focus yeah. for us, right? Get, mm -hmm. get customers in the door, new ways, give them new experiences through retail. That actually does enable other capabilities from a product perspective, right? We don't want to ship a whole bunch of other things to all the farms around the world so that we can ship those things with our flowers, right? We don't want to sell champagne, I'm just making up an SKU, and send it down to Ecuador and then have it sit on a farm and have it shipped <laughs> from Ecuador to someone's home, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but when an order is coming out of a store and somebody wants to send something with it, cookies, chocolates, ice cream, whatever it might be, shipping out of a store makes a ton of sense. Um, and so you'll see more and more that we have these local stores. You'll see more and more products that are not just fresh floral. Our store in Beverly Hills has fresh floral, dried floral, plants, pots. Uh, books, candles, calendars, you know, all the things that can be sort of bundled with floral for gifting. We, we have in those stores, not a huge quantity, not a massive amount of, of, of variety, but something that's going to just add on to that experience a bit. Um, and yes, another part of those things that's nice is they don't die. So from an inventory mm -hmm. management perspective, if 20% of your inventory doesn't die, your waste rate by definition is going to go down. 
right? <laughs> so there's also this sort of nice balance of things. So look for more stores. Um, I, you know, you'll see, I think, three more in California around the end of the year, uh, expanding, you know, in, into other states uh, as well. We have right now one in Chicago, one in New York, and, and one in LA. I will be expanding in California first and then, and then more broadly. And then, you know, along with that, the ability to deliver faster. You know, that South American trip is long. Mm -hmm. uh, delivering out of our Beverly Hills store within LA can take as little as three hours. Um, and so the ability to deliver more nimbly to the customer, which, you know, not everyone is going to be a subscriber, no matter what we do, no matter how great a subscription product is, no matter how flexible. Some people just still remember last That's right. mom's birthday is tomorrow. And we really want to be, able, be there to be able to serve those folks. And so uh, sort of, again, all customer centric. Let's give folks what they want in the way that they want it when they want it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, last question for you here, John, and, and, you know, one part of it is, is there any decision that you made along the way that was foundational that, that paid off? And we've kind of hit on that, but if you have another one, feel free to share it, but what's maybe another decision that looking back, uh, with what, you know, now, um, you're like, gosh, I wish we had done that a little bit different or had taken a different path. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I can give you two great examples. One is, you know, that tech platform we built, we didn't start building it until 2016, 2017. Right. And we were five years old at that point. We should have been doing that in the first two years. Should have raised more capital, focus less on marketing, focus more on building products. Um, because when it doesn't work at scale, it's really painful to change. Right. It costs a lot more, it takes a lot more time. So redoing it is not the yeah. right way. You want to build it right the first time, which, you know, it was also relatively early in e commerce, subscription commerce, all this stuff. But so I can give us like a little bit of an asterisk. <laughs> I wish he would have spent that money earlier and spent that time earlier. Um, the other one, which is, you know, it's more personal is, you know, I, I sort of fired myself in 2020 as, as CEO and made myself uh, executive chairman. And, you know, I would have, if I could have done that earlier, I would have, I, I should talk to my board about it way earlier. And in sort of this, this really tough conversation around, I realized over time that my, my sweet spot is building things. That's what I do now at M13, which is a venture capital fund here in Los Angeles, you know, billion dollars in asset and management in a very short time, you know, talk to your investing firm. Um, I run a venture studio inside of it and we build companies from scratch. I learned in the first two years of three years of, of building the books company that I loved building. Um, yeah. I thought what I loved was being a CEO. Um, but as the business scaled, my enjoyment um, and the quality with which I executed the job went down. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was like, oh, it's just growing pains. I'm learning. It was actually that it that wasn't the job for me. And I had a couple That's of years, I figured that out finally and went to my board and said, hey, like, maybe it's time to, to switch this up. And the response was like, no. We've invested in you. You're the guy. Um, but, but we got to an agreement of like, well, there's going to be a point at which the company can, can do this without me. And I'm not just like, they quit. I'm not going to go work right. on something else. I'm going to be here. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, my, my CEO, Kim, is a much better CEO than I ever was. And I'm happy yeah. to say it because the company's in better hands on a day-to-day -day basis. But we still work together on all the big picture stuff, all the financing and strategy stuff that I really love and which is where my background was. And she leads the company day to day. It's a really nice combination. So I would say like that sort of self-reflection of as a founder, as a CEO, where are you great? How do you lead? It doesn't mean you don't, you have to give up the CEO role, but like yeah. maybe your job changes. Maybe you're carving off a piece for your COO or maybe you're yeah. hiring a president or whatever it might be. Just as the company evolves and you evolve, finding that right mix of role and sort of title and responsibilities is really important for your own happiness and for the execution you know, in the business. And so that's one where I think I had the right insight. We didn't execute quite as fast as I would have liked. I uh, ended up pretty good at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but, you know, was, was an interesting and difficult choice to make at the time. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it takes a certain amount of just self-awareness to, to recognize that. And it sounds like that you did. Like what, what part of this really energizes me versus, a while. you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But you got there and, you know, if I, I suppose find yourself in a better spot now. So congratulations for that. But, uh, well, well, John, this has been a, a heck of a fun interview. I know mean, we covered a, a lot of ground here. Um, you already uh, mentioned the website, but maybe plug that again. And if there are any questions about what we talked about today and somebody wants to reach out, where are some of the best places to do that? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can find books at B-O-U-Q-S dot com. Um, you can, uh, you can, you can find me on LinkedIn, John Tabis, T-A-B-I-S. I'm also on Twitter, rarely at John G Tab. Oh, I guess it's now X, sorry, X, John, at John G Tabis. <laughs> but LinkedIn is, is, is probably the most, uh, the most relevant home, um, uh, to get in touch. And, you know, at M13, like I said, we build businesses with founders. And so our whole mission here 
is to help founders at the really early stage. The fund has 35 professionals who are every day, uh, we call them the propulsion team, every day operating partners to our portfolio. But we invest at Series A. My yeah. team is about helping those founders at Series pre, pre-seed. Like you've got an idea, but you don't know how to execute it. Or you have a team, but no idea. Or you have some combination of these things, but you're missing a piece. We're here to build companies with founders from the ground up. And that's really what our entire sort of operating system here at M13's Launchpad is, is designed to do. So you can find M13 at m13.co. Um, and you can, you can find me, like I said, on LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to folks about their ideas, their businesses, how to make them better. Whether we help you build it or not, that's really why we exist is for founders and, and helping make the journey a little bit easier for everyone. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for supporting our industry that way. But again, John, really enjoyed the conversation. Best of luck to you at both M13 and Books. But thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely appreciate it.